Webster Tarpley, welcome. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. The next U.S. presidential election is November 2012. Obama doesn't appear to have any serious challenge in the Democratic primaries, but there are quite a few Republican primary contenders. The Iowa caucus is January 3rd. What exactly is the Iowa caucus, and how important is is it or isn't it? Well, the Iowa caucus for Republicans, as distinct from Democrats, is that you uh, show up at a, um, a caucus location, which really amounts for the Republicans to a polling place, and you, you indicate your preference on, I think, a paper ballot, and then you walk out. It does not seem to imply for the Republicans the, um, the caucus building, right? the horse trading or negotiation or short speeches or other things that, that a caucus would su- suggest. So... Uh, that's going to be the first uh, Tuesday of the new year, right? It's all very much front-loaded. And according to the polls, uh, as we are uh, recording this this program, uh, Ron Paul seems to be the leading candidate for the Ohio Republican Caucus. And, of course, he had, uh, he had run there uh, before in 2008 when I believe he came in third, and now that he's shown as likely to come in first. I would just caveat that. In two senses, Um, a caucus, even a Republican caucus, is not quite the same thing as an election, right? If you want to go vote, you can usually get in and out within, you know, five or ten minutes, depending on where you vote and and what time, or you might hope to anyway. Uh, The caucus takes a little bit longer, so it may not be possible for the polling to predict what's going to happen in that that way. Um, The other thing is that uh, the recent winners in... uh, in a place like Iowa, have included Pat Robertson, the televangelist in 1988, and they've included uh, Preacher Huckabee from uh, from 2008. So there's a very strong uh, voting block of um, Christian fundamentalists, and uh, they may not like Ron Paul for some reasons that maybe we go through at the end, Ron Paul's social policies. But I would suggest the following. Um... People who consider themselves, say, left of center or progressive or anti-war or civil libertarians may have gotten a positive uh, impression of Ron Paul over the years because he's been certainly a gadfly in the Republican Party opposing the prevalent Bush-Cheney neocon warmonger line, which is certainly a merit, uh, and it, it remains. Right? Those are things that he's done that... Uh, that, that cannot be denied. He's also pretty reliable uh, as a vote against things like the Patriot Act uh, and so forth. Although, I must say, uh, he did vote for the 9-11 resolution, which led to the war in Afghanistan. So he's not exactly a man for all seasons in opposing uh, aggressive war. He went along with the post-9-11 hysteria uh, to that extent. But I would suggest now that we, we take a look at the most detailed policy paper that he has put out for this election cycle, which is his Restore America program, which is a a fairly detailed economic program, not as detailed as some, but uh, it's certainly something to to go on. It's called Plan to Restore America. It was issued around the middle of October, and I noticed that in the the run-up to the Iowa caucus, Scant attention is paid to this, right? The, the news media, especially the ones who want to oppose Ron Paul, are more interested in his old uh, newsletters from the, from the 1990s and the various racist, uh, anti-black or other remarks that are, that are contained in there. I would simply say uh, Ron Paul really ought to say who wrote those. If he didn't write them, then he should really be in a position to say who did. But I would say put that aside. Let's go on the basis of what he says he wants to do if elected president uh, this time around. Now, Ron Paul is the front runner at this point. 22%. Uh, yeah, and this caucus is going to happen quite soon on January 3rd. Now, what is his Restore America budget proposal that he's actually now saying what he would do? Right. Well, let's take a look at this. I think this is this is by now eminently fair game and, and fairer to him. Than, than his uh, his newsletters, disturbing as those may they certainly are. Um, he starts off with a plan to cut one trillion dollars out of the U.S. federal budget in one year, and I, I stress the idea of one year. 
You have perhaps heard during the course of the Super Committee, otherwise known as the 12 Tyrants, uh, that group of six Republicans and six Democrats, I guess it was, uh, that this this came down to uh, cutting 1.2 trillion, but that 1.2 trillion was spread out over 10 years, and at a certain point they talked about a grand bargain of cutting 4 trillion or more. That was also spread out over over uh, 10 years. So that whole uh, committee never came to any agreement, right? Thank just, God. They struck out. But now, now, obviously, now we have the automatic guillotine, the sequestering. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not clear when that will happen or if it will ever happen, because the Congress may, may head it off. But again, let's focus on Ron Paul, because this is going to be the big news item. I think he's either going to win the Iowa caucus or he's going to do, he's going to come in second or third, I would think, is a, is a fair um, prognostication. Think of $1 trillion dollars. That's one thousand billion U.S. dollars in one year. Uh, this is again; it's it's uh, ten times more concentrated than what the super committee was talking about. Right? Those twelve tyrants, bad as they were, were talking about something much more gradual. For Ron Paul, it's cut one trillion of spending during the first year of the presidency and balance the budget. Bring the federal budget into balance by uh, the end of a four-year term. Now, that's already the most radical austerity plan of any candidate, and it's also the most radical austerity that any modern uh, industrial or even post-industrial society has ever uh, experienced. Uh, If you want a a comparison, I compared it to sort of the, the landmark austerity of the, the 20th century, I think, is uh, Chancellor Heinrich Brüning in Germany between 1930 and 1932. Um, my estimate, just comparing these things in a kind of a rough proportionality, is that Ron Paul's cut of $1 trillion of the U.S. federal budget, which amounts to 27%, something like that, a little bit more than one quarter in one year, that this is, on the whole, four times more severe than what Bruning did uh, between 1930 and 1932. And Bruning did it over two years, and that's included in my calculation. So with Ron Paul, you're getting something four times more severe than Bruning. And I think that ought to give us pause, because I think it's generally understood that whether Bruning had alternatives or, or not, the net effect of his austerity program was to destroy the German economy with rising unemployment and falling tax revenue, uh, and to destroy the political system, such that uh, you know, within about six months after Brüning left office, uh, Hitler became chancellor. So this is basically what, what prepared the ground for the worst kind of fascism uh, seen so far. So I think that, that ought to get, get us to, to pause. Twenty-seven percent austerity in one year. The government in Britain, Cameron and uh, Osborne and Clegg, they had talked about cutting spending by 25% when they came in, uh, in, uh, in in May of 2010, but they haven't come anywhere near that. So here we have Ron Paul saying that he's actually going to do it. Now, I think what, what people may be interested in is, is where do these uh, spending cuts then occur? So 27% would be the norm across the board. Um, given, given the fact that Ron Paul has made his name as an opponent of militarism and foreign adventurism and foreign bases and so forth, we would ex- certainly expect, I think, that if everybody is going to get cut 27% across the entire federal budget uh, as a uh, sort of a you know, general rule, that the Pentagon would get cut at least as much or maybe more, but uh, I'm afraid we find that that's not the case. The 27% across the board cut uh, goes together with a 15% cut in the Pentagon. So the Pentagon is asked to give up about half of what the federal budget as a whole is being asked to give up, a 15% Pentagon cut. Not very radical, and really that that is not even radical compared to other other proposals that are that are now going around. But I think you can also then look at uh, certain social programs that I think raise the the, the relevant uh, doubt 
concerning what Ron Paul is up to. Suppose we look at an area like child nutrition. Uh, this is largely the WIC program, right? Women, infants, and children. And it comes down to things like high-protein meals for pregnant women, nursing mothers, young mothers, and infants. Uh, and it's a very, very effective um, program. And with the United States is spending all of $21 billion on that, right? A few days of, uh, of the Afghan war. $21 billion is spent on WIC. Ron Paul would cut one-third of that program. That is a $7 billion cut, 33%. So, again, Pentagon gets cut 15%. Women, infants, children get cut 33%. And this comes down to things like cheese and dairy foods and things like this that are high protein. The costs incurred with such a program, I think, allow us to ask whether this is not a uh, false economy because you're talking about things like cognitive impairment due to insufficient protein consumption uh, in uh, infancy and uh, early childhood. And I think that's a, that's a very, very short-sighted cut, to put it mildly. And then let's go on. S-CHIP, the uh, state-run child health insurance program. This is one of the things that Senator Kennedy had championed. Well, Right now, the budget for that is $9 billion. Ron Paul wants to cut $4 billion. That brings it down to $5 billion. So Ron Paul would cut 44% of the S-CHIP program. And again, federal budget as a whole, 27%. Pentagon gets cut 15%. But for some reason, child health insurance gets cut 44%. Now, these are small amounts, but the effect of this, I think, is, is uh, quite remarkable because with s chip you're dealing with parents who are so poor that they can't afford any health care for themselves but they can get they can get it for their children just about automatically if they meet you know the poverty tests for this right, the means test for for s chip i'm speaking with economic historian and author webster tarpley today's show critique of ron paul's austerity plan i'm bonnie faulkner this is Guns and Butter. What other important programs is he suggesting be cut? The two big things that, that Ron Paul would cut, I think, are also very disturbing. One is Medicaid, duh, right? Medicaid. This is not Medicare, right? This is not people over 65. This is Medicaid, and this is the health program that is run through the states for poor people, basically. The current budget, $276 billion. Ron Paul would cut $95 billion out of that. So that's a 35% cut. Again, Pentagon cut 15%. Medicaid cut 35% uh, by comparison. And I think that is, uh, that's, that's a very destructive uh, cut because what it goes to is people who are on Medicaid are already basically at their last resort. The only thing that's left after Medicaid is private charity, which may be there or may not be there, depending on where you are and, and who you are and so forth. The other thing that Medicaid does is that it, it protects the resources, the, the property, and Ron Paul likes to talk a lot about property, the property of the U.S. middle class in the age of Alzheimer's and, uh, and increasing costs for nursing home care this this actually protects, uh, and I was at a, a, a party just before Christmas where a guy brought this up, right, that his mother had, had passed away after a long illness, and, and part, of the, part of the care for her was covered by Medicaid, although he was firmly in the middle class, right, living in a, in a home in Bethesda, Maryland. This, this protected him from going destitute with his, with his wife and his, uh, and his son. So uh, it's, it's a very, very big uh, cut for the health of poor people, where obviously we have 40 to 50 million still uninsured, unless and until something else kicks in, which we're not sure of, uh, and this protection for families who have an elderly parent, say, in a nursing home, that, so that doesn't eat your entire um, you know, asset pool that you've got. And then I think probably the most extreme and maybe the most characteristic, food stamps. Now, food stamps have been used by... I'm afraid, Republican demagogues to, uh, to characterize Obama, right? That, uh, I think Gingrich says Obama is the food stamp 
president and Gingrich wants to be the job president. Well, I think the scandal is not that the program exists, but that it's, it's actually needed. Right now, about 50 million Americans, 50 million Americans live on food stamps. And uh, this is not a generous benefit. If you're one person, the maximum food stamp benefit is $180. And that's the maximum. If you have a little bit of uh, property or a little bit of savings, then it, then it becomes less than that. So Ron Paul wants to cut $50 billion out of an $80 billion program. In other words, a cut of 63%, almost two-thirds. So again, Pentagon 15%, food stamps cut 63%. And if we just do the arithmetic, it means that the maximum benefit would not be in the area of $180 a month for one person. It would go down to something like 60 dollars a month or fifteen dollars a week now try living eating anything uh that's that can keep body and soul together for fifteen dollars a week and I, I think if we look at in particular the inherent problems uh, of the uh, child nutrition and child health on the one side and then if we look at the broad-based impact on the poor right the, because the people who get medicaid and the people who get food stamps are likely to be quite a few of them the same people and they're getting cut between one-third and two-thirds i think you can see a tendency and what i mean by that is this we've been burned by obama right obama said uh, vote for me i'm not bush i'll put an end to the wars and the abuses of the bush administration and instead he basically starts a war with pakistan certainly starts a war with libya claims the right to assassinate american citizens carries that out in one case uh he claims that he can uh, incarcerate you in guantanamo bay and indeed torture you if you have opinions that he considers uh dangerous so instead of what we were promised we got something quite different now if we look at the republicans right with boehner and, and the and the house uh, tea party uh, majority they ran talking about jobs 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 but instead when they got in it was tax cuts for the rich and their strange ideas about social policy. So I think we have to ask, is a bait-and-switch uh, in progress here, where Ron Paul talks about peace and opposition to dictatorship and totalitarianism on the home front, but instead we seem to be getting a draconian, brutal series of, uh, of budget cuts. And one or two other things about this. There is the Davis-Bacon Act, uh, landmark legislation, and it, what it prescribes is that if you have a federal construction project, then that has to pay union wages. It's called the prevailing wage standard. And prevailing wage is interpreted to mean union wages, union pay scales. So you're not going to get a federal construction job and then be expected to work for the federal minimum wage. Um, it's, it's significantly higher. Uh, if you wipe out the Davis-Bacon Act, then this essentially destroys a whole series of, of trade unions. And the, the savings on this, $6 billion, but at the same time, look at the, look at the social impact, right? The trade unions would cease to exist. The combination of Ron Paul, the father, and Senator Rand Paul, the son, right, Senator from Kentucky, what they both want to do is to change the Taft-Hartley law, which currently governs uh, union uh, policies, at, the, at least at the federal level, they want it so that instead of having a state's right to choose to be a uh, union state, or, or to put it the other, way, the other way, instead of having some states that have chosen to be right-to-work states where organizing unions is almost impossible, this is the southern belt in general, the Rand Paul and, and Ron Paul, too, they want to essentially have a, a compulsion at the federal level that everybody has to be a right-to-work state. So between the abolition of the Davis-Bacon Act and the universal right-to-work status, um, there would be no trade union movement left. Now, I, I, I wonder about this. First of all, Ron Paul talks about states' rights all the time, but... Right now, we have a state's right to choose not to be a right-to-work state. And my interpretation of, of Ron Paul's policy and his son's is that they want to change that so that you're no longer allowed 
to be anything but a right-to-work state. So states' rights, in their interpretation, goes out the window. Interesting, uh, interesting contradiction, wouldn't you say? The other thing is, if you want to have resistance to totalitarianism, and we saw this, for example, in the Occupy Wall Street movement, right? the point at which that took off was the moment when the communications workers of America, the transport workers union, the American Federation of Teachers, and others, when they showed up, to swell the ranks of the of the protesters there at Zuccotti Park, you could see the idea that if you had a some kind of a fascist coup, or if some some president went went uh, uh, over the line, right, bonkers in terms of crushing civil liberties, the only hope for organizing a general strike and other forms of resistance against that would be a union, would be a, a trade union movement, you know, even such as it is, it would be the the starting point. But somehow between Ron Paul and Rand Paul, they want to wipe out the only institutions that could mount a resistance against uh, totalitarian measures of that sort. So, on the whole, rather strange, wouldn't you say? The other thing here is, if we look at, at Ron Paul's um, tax policy that goes with this, and I'm now basically making the transition over into, into, the, into the tax side of the ledger, well, he wants to keep the Bush tax cuts, right, permanently. Oh, absolutely. He wants to keep the Bush tax cuts, and he wants to add, um, well, he, he wants to, to keep these, these Bush tax cuts, which, as everybody knows, inordinate, inordinately, exorbitantly favor the rich. Uh, he wants to keep, keep the Bush tax cuts, and he wants to abolish the capital gains tax. Now, if you look at the U.S. economy, you would have to say that the, the principal, one of the principal problems of the U.S. economy is this over-financialization, the uh, extreme uh, emphasis on financial services, right? Non-productive financial services, speculation, moving paper around, uh, the 1.5 quadrillion or so of derivatives with much of it focused here in the United States. Ron Paul would essentially subsidize further parasitical speculation and related activities by simply abolishing the capital gains tax. So that if you were a full-time speculator, you would pay no, no taxes uh, at that level, right, in terms of the, uh, the capital gains. That money would be, would be for you, right? You wouldn't pay income tax on it. But if you were a worker, you would pay, you would pay a tax. So no capital gains tax and no estate tax, or as he would call it, no death tax. So it means that if you were a, a speculator who made out like a bandit in the Reagan bubbles of the 80s and the, the uh, a, a irrational exuberance of Greenspan in the 90s and into the, into the current bubble economy of the, uh, the, the wealth effect and so forth, that the last chance to have you contribute to the public treasury will be gone because Ron Paul wants to give you an absolute uh, free ride. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, he wants to cut the corporate income tax down to 15%. The corporate income tax is, is really not paid by a whole lot of very large entities, right? General Electric, um, you know, notoriously under Imelt, paid zero corporate income tax in the most recent year that I'm aware of. But uh, Ron Paul says even bring that down, right? Bring it down from I think the current level is 35%. Bring that down to 15%. Percent. All right. So this is tax relief for speculators, tax relief for those who are already rich and who want to inherit, and tax relief for for corporations, including banks. So, yeah, is there any tax relief for the average person? And the answer is no. There is no proposal to cut uh, anybody's taxes uh, beyond that. No, but you could imagine somebody saying, "Well, uh, I'd like to increase the size of the personal." Uh, deduction, right? The standard deduction could go up. The personal exemption could go up, right? That would, that would raise, the, that would be the rising tide that would lift all boats from below. But with Ron Paul, there's absolutely nothing like that. There's no tax relief for anybody except a speculator, you're already rich, or a corporation. Well, isn't he also proposing to eliminate taxes on foreign profits? Yes, yes, of course. In other words, he wants to essentially reward corporations that have hoarded money abroad, essentially evading U.S. taxes. He wants to basically have an amnesty 
allowing them to bring this home with no um, no mechanism to be sure that this got invested in plant and equipment as distinct from derivatives or speculation, uh, and no no taxation of it. Right. So this would be in addition to these other to these other cuts. So you'd have to look at this and say, if you're the Koch brothers, uh, the richest man in uh, in New York City, Koch or Coke, as he likes to call himself, putting on airs. Uh, the Coke brothers, or the Koch brothers, as I think it says in, uh, in, in um, the spelling that I can see, uh, they, they would be delighted. Soros would be delighted. Soros was also delighted with Ron Paul's drug policy. We can maybe get to that later on. Uh, but generally speaking, this is, this is precisely uh, what uh, Wall Street demands. And there are uh, indeed reports that in the 1990s, if not more recently, Ron Paul was financed by the uh, by the Koch brothers, right? The Koch brothers, the people who founded the Cato Inst- Institute or who who made important contributions at the beginning to make the Cato Institute possible. That's the leading libertarian think tank here in Washington D.C. Um, quite plausible that they would have given some money to a leading libertarian libertarian presidential candidate going back there, uh, Ron Paul. I'm speaking with economic historian and author Webster Tarpley. Today's show, Critique of Ron Paul's Austerity Plan. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. What five cabinet departments is Ron Paul proposing to eliminate? Right, this was his fight with Rick Perry, Rick Perry wanted to eliminate three of them, but couldn't remember the third. And Ron Paul said, no, that's not enough. So they had a, they had a bidding war. Who was going to destroy more uh, departments of the, of the federal uh, executive? Well, it's basically these. It's the Department of Energy goes to zero. The Department of Housing and Urban Development goes to zero. The Department of Commerce goes to zero. The Department of the Interior goes to zero. The Department of Education goes to zero. Now, I should also mention this is within the framework of what he wants as a 10% cut in the total number of federal uh, workers. In other words, I think the employees of the, of the federal government are about 4.5 million. So if it's 10%, we're talking about half a million new unemployed, which would create uh, severe depressed areas. Well, Washington, D.C. would certainly go, and Maryland and Virginia would all become a, uh, a depressed area, and, and not just those. Some other ones would, too. If you look at the Department of Energy, uh, this has to do with, uh, well, it has to do with maintaining all kinds of uh, standards on, uh, say, nuclear reactors, things like this. Um, it has, a, a, you know, national laboratories are in there. Housing and urban development, right? There's not a lot of public housing being built in the United States, but what there is relies to some extent on on subsidies coming from HUD, housing and urban development. The Department of Commerce, uh, that's, among other things, the uh, U.S. Weather Service, and it's an attempt to maintain U.S. exports abroad, in other words, to create jobs that way. The Department of the Interior, well, those are the, uh, are the national parks, but also important things that have to do with uh, resource management in part of that. The Department of Education, now here we're talking about things like Pell Grants, uh, the, the various student loans that are, that are offered, which uh, unfortunately are, uh, people have to rely on too much, and then the Pell Grant side of it. In other words, if you're a, if you're a low-income student and you want to go to college, you're virtually your only hope is to get a Pell Grant, which is not generous. I, I forget what it is right now. It's a couple of thousand dollars a year. We could check the amount. But it's, it's, it's hardly enough to, to get by at a community college or a, a public institution. But that's what there is. So for all of that, for public housing, for Pell Grants, for poor kids to go to college, uh, for various things to do with, with energy, the promotion of exports, the weather, weather forecasting, there's nothing left. It all goes to zero. Uh, it would be a, a colossal, colossal uh, impact on the, on the federal government. And he thinks that all of these, of course, are unconstitutional and so forth. We'll talk about his constitutional theories, too. The other thing that I would, I would stress is um, all foreign aid 
in the State Department. The State Department takes a big hit because all foreign aid is terminated. Um, now, that's about 50 or $60 billion, and certainly there are things in there. For example, that we're told that the, uh, the U.S. claims that they paid $10 million to try to hijack the, the latest Russian elections, right, to get people to, to vote against Putin, to get them to vote for candidates in some cases who are national Bolsheviks. Anybody but, but Putin seems to be the idea. Now, in reality, it's more than 9 or 10 million. It might be a, a 100 million. Who knows what it is? So there are things in the foreign aid budget which are, I think, uh, reprehensible and should end. But then... Let's uh, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. One thing is, if you look at the, the situation of food in the world, uh, emergency food aid available on planet Earth, the United States, uh, in spite of everything, still provides 57%, well over half, of all the food aid in this world. And it comes down to, in particular, about 2.5 million metric tons of food aid costing $2.6 billion a year. Now, in 44 countries, and you can think of some dramatic examples, right, in Somalia, in South Sudan, in northern Kenya, across the Sahel Belt, go to some place like Mali, where the, the Libyan uh, food operations have now been destroyed by the attack on Libya, where famine is presumably uh, spreading. Places like Bangladesh, places like Pakistan, in the recent flood. Haiti, to be sure. Um, make a catalog of all disaster and famine areas across the world, and you will see that the U.S. is there, right? This is food for peace, as Kennedy, Kennedy called it. So the Kennedy Food for Peace program would simply cease to exist. Now, I, I don't have statistics to back this up, but I would invite somebody to consider, to score this, not in terms of deficits, but in terms of human lives, as indeed all of these, every, everything that we've talked about so far, has implications for morbidity, mortality, um, longevity, all kinds of effects on human life, all of them uh, generally uh, negative, that if you simply take two and a half million metric tons of food aid out of a world where there's about five, uh, five million metric tons of, of food aid, or actually a little bit less, uh, people will die. Uh, as a result of that. And maybe it, it's not generally difficult to guess that more people can die through the economics of famine and epidemic that are related than, say, through military operations. And it's a, generally a truism. Right? Robert McNamara killed more people at the World Bank than he ever killed in Vietnam simply because that's the power of economics. So in Ron Paul's case, it's not just the five departments but it's also the entire USAID and, and, above all, United States Department of Agriculture Food for Peace that would simply cease to exist. And I think this would, uh, this would shock the world. Now, I read that Ron Paul wants to repeal Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley. What are these? Right. Uh, he wants to deregulate uh, everything. Uh, and this, this has to do with his, um, his ideology, right, the so-called Austrian school which is that government uh, intervention in any form in uh, economic life is inadmissible. It's wrong. He tries to argue that this is unconstitutional. I don't think he has any case at all for that, given you know, U.S. history as well as just the, the, the U.S. Constitution as a document. But he wants, to, he wants to get rid of these things. Now, these are not good laws in general. On the other hand, the, the whole section is what got us where we are, right? Just take two examples. Deregulation and privatization. Well, privatization of what? Um, the Republican debates in general say, will say, oh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and subprime lending to minority groups in, you know, uh, rundown neighborhoods, those people buying homes, that's what caused the Depression. Well, uh, even if you, if you want to take that seriously, which I don't, you'd have to say, how did Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that were founded as government organizations, agencies, uh, back in the New Deal or, or more recently, how did they become private uh, entities? Well, they were privatized. So you had the worst of all possible worlds. You had uh, a private management for profit, but with an implicit uh, guarantee from the federal government for the, for the uh, agency bonds that they put out, the Fannies and, and the Freddies. So 
if you want to know, even in, in terms of the reactionary zone argument, where the depression comes from, you'd have to say it comes, number one, from, from privatization. Now, of course, Fannie and Freddie are, are a tiny, tiny part of the real story. The real story is derivatives. In other words, that colossal edifice of credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, structured investment vehicles, uh, repos, and so forth. That immense castle of 1.5 quadrillion of derivatives built on top, in, in many cases, of subprime loans, that's what caused the, the actual depression. And where did that come from? Well, from 1936 to 1982, derivatives were strictly illegal in the United States under the Commodity Exchange Act of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And it was the deregulation of derivatives from 1982 to the Bush, the elder administration, to Rubin and Greenspan and Summers and these people in the late 90s. That's what opened the door to the derivatives bubble. So we're in a depression caused by deregulation and privatization. And Ron Paul says we need more deregulation and, and privatization, which I don't think makes uh, any sense. Um, the other thing that's, that's worth pointing out is in terms of economic policy, Ron Paul, is, he was against the, the bailout, and, and certainly that was, it was a fine thing to be against the, the bailout proposed by Bush and Paulson back in October of 2008. But at the same time, Ron Paul is very much against doing anything to maintain uh, economic uh, growth or development or a, really any kind of government intervention into, into economics. Uh, and this is, once again, because of the Austrian school. I think it's, it's fair to say Ron Paul's economic policy is an immediate deflationary crash. And the more severe, the better. Uh, this, people probably recognize this as Schumpeter's uh, creative destruction. It's associated in American history with Andrew Mellon, the arch-reactionary uh, Secretary of the Treasury, under whom, uh, as we say, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover served. Uh, Andrew Mellon, who, whose litany was liquidate stocks, liquidate bonds, liquidate labor, liquidate the farmer, liquidate real estate, liquidate everything. In other words, everything should crash down, and then, after this orgy of creative destruction, then there'll be a recovery. Uh, and, of course, the problem with that is, what, what if you starve to death in, in the meantime? What if, what if you don't survive the creative destruction? What if you die? Uh, this is an argument that appeals to people who have money and who believe they will continue to have money, because it allows them to say, uh, I'll be sitting here with my with my stash of cash, and when everything else goes down, I can buy up everybody and everything at a small fraction of the current uh, rates after the panic. And I think that this thinking is characteristic of Ron Paul's inner circle. I think is is um, we could argue based on some things that Peter Schiff uh, talked about uh, recently. Peter Schiff was the economics advisor for Ron Paul in the 2008 campaign. He then went to Connecticut, or he went back to Connecticut, where his, his um, hedge fund is located, and then he ran for Senate, and he was defeated in 2010. And uh, Schiff was on, on uh, I think, CNBC in the last uh, six months or so, seriously arguing that unemployment in the United States needed to go much higher, that the, the levels of unemployment reached in the U.S. are not enough. Again, this is the idea that the crisis has to play itself out, burn itself out, it has to bottom out, and there's nothing you can do about it. This is one of the features of the, of the Austrian school, is that it's practically sacrilegious to try to fight a depression. To fight a depression for the Austrian school is a contradiction in terms. You can't do that. You've got to let the depression you know, wash over you, play itself out, and then there'll be a recovery. And, of course, if you ask, where are the empirical examples historically of letting a depression burn itself out? Uh, they can't give you any. Uh, the, the one that comes closest, I guess, is the burning, once again, the 1930 to 32 in Germany. But you'll see that under concrete social conditions, right, in the presence of some kind of a state, i.e. a government, that there'll be a, a, some form of political development that will overtake uh, you know, this crisis before it reaches absolute bottom it simply has to be that way hard, hard to imagine it any other way so that's what you're dealing with uh it's nice to be against the bailout 
But then to say, I'm against the bailout and I'm against anything else that might be done. I, I think this, for many people, this, this is maybe not so evident, but I think it is, it is implicit in, in what, um, what Ron Paul is, is arguing. Austrianism basically says that it's impossible to have a jobs program. And, and I, I would point to this maybe as an element of, of pessimism in the entire thing. Um, scientific, technological, industrial progress cannot be fostered by any government activity, according to these Austrians, right? just can't be done. Um, and therefore, they would say, you can't have a jobs program. All you can do is let the market go. In other words, let the market find its own way so that there's really nothing you can do. When you, when, and indeed, when you ask these Republicans in general, uh, what's your jobs program? They'll say tax cuts, deregulation, and, and uh, cut uh, government employment and, and so forth. In other words, deflation and austerity. And you'd say, well, where's the jobs program in that? And they'd say, well, there, there can't be a jobs program because jobs created by government in any form are simply uh, not allowable. So it's a, it's a very strange um, universe, this uh, Austrian school. I'm speaking with economic historian and author Webster Tarpley. Today's show, Critique of Ron Paul's Austerity Plan. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Now, is there anything else in uh, Ron Paul's Restore America budget that uh, we should mention? Well, uh, maybe deflation. Huh? This is another another one of his, um, uh, I guess, shibboleths, it's fair to say. Uh, he wants a strong dollar. Uh, sounds good, but think about that concretely. If you look at American history, the uh, the big social issue from about 1870 to about 1910 was deflation, right? The cross of gold, right? A gold-backed currency that turned out to be the worst possible thing for the farmers, for the South, for the Midwest, for the Far West. Uh, large parts of the U.S. were sacrificed on this cross of gold uh, as a result of the Specie Resumption Act and the Coin Act of the 1870s. So that when farmers looked at the world, the prices they got were going down, 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 and the dollars they had to pay back were going up, 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 because the dollar was getting very strong. Is that really what you want? You look at the United States today, what's the first thing you see? Um, the student loan debt of the current generation is about $1 trillion, and it's rising fast. And we have consumer credit card and related charge plate debt another trillion. So we got $2 trillion of debt, plus mortgage debt, plus all kinds of other things. You got a lot of American families underwater so that their net worth is actually negative. And the main problem they have is debt. So if Ron Paul says he wants a strong dollar, he wants to have an international credit policy that would strengthen the dollar, then uh, I think that's going to be very bad for a lot of people because you'll be paying back ultimately. He doesn't, he doesn't say he wants to make the transition to a gold standard in this program. He's talked about that, though, and presumably he would like to strengthen the dollar to the point where a high dollar would have an easier transition into a gold standard. I think a gold standard for most people in the United States would be an unmitigated disaster. If you have a lot of debt or if you have really any debt uh, you know any significant debt at all that would be very bad for you the examples of, of returning to a gold standard just to keep it historical too uh, after the napoleonic wars the british went back on the gold standard and that gives you the world of dickensian cruelty right, that you've heard about during the during the holidays the british then went back again on the gold standard in the 1920s and they had three to four million unemployed it was the largest unemployment in any advanced industrial country in all of history. Uh, the United States went back on the gold standard in the 1870s with the bad results that I've just said. So the three examples of going back on a gold standard that we've had so far are bad. That deflation is, is bad, especially if you do it that way. So uh, the other thing is you, you look and see what, what, what does Ron Paul say about things like corporate welfare. And he promises in the introduction that he will end corporate subsidies. So then you'd say, all right, I'm going to look and see where we change the tax laws 
to change these things like the oil depletion allowance, the various subsidies given to ExxonMobil and things like that. You don't find any any details. So I, I really wonder whether there's anything serious in there about getting rid of, of corporate welfare, in particular some of the more egregious examples like the oil company. So then whose interests are served by the Ron Paul Restore America budget? Well, I think you have to distinguish. There's a certain ideological appeal. If you think that debt is the equivalent of original sin and that what you've got to do is somehow cleanse yourself of all debt, that you've got to have a a balanced budget as a matter of ideological purity, um, if you want to define interest in those ways, then I would say it's about a 15% slice of the U.S. population who are in favor of these programs. But I'm afraid that really for most of them, this would be destructive. In other words, they're buying something where the implications go uh, far beyond what they think and would actually be be harmful to them. Um, I guess the easiest way in the current ideological climate is to say, this is a program for the 1%, for sure. This is the interest of the 1%. Again, no capital gains tax, no estate tax, corporate income tax of 15%, keep the Bush tax cuts, but no tax relief for working people, for the lower middle class, for the middle middle, taking away these important, um, what can we call them, subsidies, sure, subsidium, right, help, that's all it means, helps, for example, that, that poor kids could go to college with a Pell Grant, or that there might be some public housing going on, right, all of that removed. So you could say that this um, would hit the, uh, the middle class pretty much uh, quite hard, and the, the, the beneficiaries would really be the, the 1%. How do you account for Ron Paul's appeal? What is making him so popular among his supporters? Well, it has to do with uh, his track record, again, of being a gadfly and being very heretical concerning the orthodoxy of of the Republican Party during 2007-2008 and being anti-war, right, during the era of Bush-Cheney and the neocons. Ron Paul was... was, um, was anti-war. The problem with this is that um, we also we have to raise the question of election promises and then the delivery on those promises. And I, I don't see how you could talk about any politician without doing this. So I would I would I would suggest uh, looking into this uh, concerning September 11th, 2001. There's a there's a significant amount of Ron Paul's base that somehow still have this idea that uh, Ron Paul is the guy who's going to bring truth and clarity into the inside job of of 9-11 truth. Now, I've I've written a book about this myself, so 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in USA in the fifth edition is is pretty much my my view of the subject. But when Ron Paul was running in 2007-2008, speaking off the record to small groups of supporters, He made, I think it's fair to say, some um, significant promises about what he was going to do to speak up for 9-11 truth, or at least to speak up for a new investigation of some sort. And this carried on all through the 2007 uh, season of the Republican um, presidential debates. They had quite a few with all those with all those candidates. And there was always this this constant, uh, you know, subtext that Ron Paul was the 9-11 truth candidate. Finally, finally, in the South Carolina debate, uh, January 10th, 2008, uh, the uh, Fox News, and I think this was Carl Cameron, asked Ron Paul, many of your supporters call themselves 9-11 truthers. They believe that the U.S. government was in some way complicit with the 9-11 attacks or covered up. Are you tonight prepared to either embrace that rhetoric or ask those supporters to abandon it or to divorce themselves from your candidacy? And Ron Paul's answer is, I can't tell people what to do, but I've abandoned those viewpoints. I don't believe that, and that's all. That's the only thing that's important, so I don't endorse anything they say. And then he goes on saying, this kind of talk doesn't do me any good. If they care about it, they would... They should stop, basically, implicit in the question. Uh, I can only control what I say. 
I don't endorse what they say. I don't believe that. Can I please get back to the current debate rather than talking about this uh, anymore? So that's, I think, a pretty clear repudiation of any idea of 9-11 truth. And the, the thing that makes it significant is that he had made these promises somewhat off the record, but some of them you can find in, in old um, you know, uh, YouTube clips right, made by individuals in smaller groups. Uh, and that goes together with some other things, right? He says that he's against earmarks. Um, well, turns out in 2009, you remember after we had the stimulus, we had another one called the supplemental. It was about 400, 450 billion dollars. Ron Paul, in the dead of night, inserted about 250 million dollars for the renovation of the port of Galveston, Texas. That's the district he represents. So he managed to insert that into the supplemental. And then when the supplemental came up, he voted against it, and the supplemental passed with the Democratic vote. So he, he inserted it, and then he, uh, he voted against it. Now, I would certainly say, don't go through all of that strange dance, right? Stand up and say, the Port of Galveston is an American national interest, right? We need it. We need Mobile, we need New Orleans, and we need Galveston-Houston, because that's, that's part of the economic viability of a huge hinterland. It's a national interest to have that infrastructure up to date. Now, Ron Paul can't say that because he doesn't believe it, but nevertheless, he goes ahead and does this thing with, the, with inserting the entitlements in the dead of night and then voting against them in the, in the light of, of noonday. Another one is the Fed. He talks about ending the Fed. He's written a book called Ending the Fed. Well, we look in the economic program, right, the Restore America program, and all we have in there about the Fed is to audit the Fed. Well, I think that's pretty tame. I mean, is there is there some confusion that what the Fed is doing is is wrong? I think that's pretty clear, right? The the you know the trillions and trillions of dollars that have been lent at very low rates, right, to foreign banks. Right? We don't need to go through the whole list. I mean, this stuff has, has come out. It's also it is of course outrageous that the Fed is not regularly audited, right, that it, it should really be audited every evening by, by some uh, competent authority. But you see that, that Ron Paul, he talks a good game of doing something about the Fed, but he, he's not proposing any institutional change for the Fed. So that's, I think, uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the three points, and I guess we could have more points, that, that allow you to ask, is Ron Paul campaigning on an anti-war and anti dictatorship program, and is he going to give you something then very different in the way that, that Obama did and, uh, and Boehner did? And then why do you think it's so important to go over all of the things that Ron Paul stands for? Again, because I think people need to know what they're actually going to get. Uh, he has said it. Uh, this is his program. And uh, I think you have, to be, uh, you have to be aware of what's coming. We had those uh, important polls. I think they were the uh, NBC polls back in the back in the springtime, which showed that in spite of everything, in spite of Obama, in spite of Clinton, in spite of uh, all the propaganda coming from the Koch brothers and the Republicans, that the level of support of the American population for the main New Deal, uh, New Frontier, and Great Society programs, in particular Social Security and Medicare that just about everybody sees themselves needing. The support for this is somewhere in the area of 65 to 70 percent. Uh, when you get down to specifics, do you support a surtax for millionaires, which Ron Paul, of course, would oppose? Uh, that's about 81 percent of the American people were in favor of that. So you'd have to say, this is New Deal America, in spite of everything. So that Ron Paul's ceiling if we go by his economic program, is really about 15 or perhaps 20 percent at the very, very most. Um, but that, of course, doesn't rule out um, bait and switch. In other words, that somebody would run for office saying, I will end the wars, I will liberate you from being harassed in airports by you know, these crazy um, transportation safety people, right? Uh, you, you might have a situation where, under conditions of breakdown, 
something very surprising might happen. A lot of people might vote for Ron Paul who really don't favor the kinds of economic programs that we're talking about. And therefore, I think it's important to, uh, to make sure that people realize what they're getting because these things are never really completely secret. They can hardly be. And in the case of Ron Paul, he has put out now the plan to restore America that tells us, um, tells us about these things. Webster Tarpley, thank you very much. Thank you.